Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mary Pouton, Assistant Dean for Development at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to our Doctors in Dialogue event. Thank you so much for joining us. More than a year ago, when the coronavirus began to cripple our nation and our world, the University of Maryland School of Medicine was on the front line to fight this pandemic. Our vaccine experts have been working tirelessly on research to bring this pandemic under control. Our COVID-19 experts have been at the forefront of vaccine research, including the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Novavax vaccines. We are honored to bring you our program today. Before we begin, I'd like to note a little later in the program, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask questions via our chat below. Simply select the chat box, select my name, type in your question and click submit. You can submit these questions anytime during the program. Also, this meeting is being recorded. If you'd like to view it again at a later date, we will be sending you this link. You can share this with others who were not able to attend today. Now, let's begin our program. Our first speaker this afternoon will be Dr. E. Albert Reese. Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, the John Z. and Akiko K. Bowers Distinguished Professor and Dean of the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dean Race. Thank you, Mary, and welcome to all our alumni and friends who may be uh, visiting us online. We're delighted that uh, we can meet together in this uh, virtual format. Obviously, we would much rather being together in a much in a more intimate face to face uh, way, but this is where we are and we're thankful for the technology that has made it available to us. In a moment, uh, we will be introducing to you our featured speaker, and that's one of our own professors here, Dr. Kristen Like, and she'll be introduced formal in a moment, and <clears throat> she will give you updates on the School of Medicine uh, efforts, or at least one aspect of the School of Medicine efforts relative to our COVID-19 research uh, work. But let me just uh, share with you a few high points regarding uh, or, or efforts. As many of you know, we've had for many years, uh, about 50 years, roughly speaking, a very uh, prestigious Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health that has been involved in most major vaccine development, whether it be uh, uh, the Ebola or H1N1 or Zika, uh, just any or H1, ma major uh, diseases around the world, we have been very much involved. And COVID-19 is obviously one of those that has rocked the entire world. And so we have been involved. And Dr. Like will share with you uh, some aspects in, uh, in the work that she and her colleagues are actually doing. I wanna just highlight a few others. Another member of the team is Dr. Wilbur Chen, professor in the Department of Medicine. And he has just been selected uh, by the, the, the US Department of Health and Human Services to serve on an advisory committee on immunization practices. This is a very uh, robust committee that makes recommendations on the safe use of vaccines uh, uh, for all Americans. Dr. Chen is also, has also served on the Governor of Maryland's task force on COVID, uh, on the pandemic uh, uh, recommendations and, and strategies. So again, we have been very much on the front line involved in various forms of advice, uh, research, clinical work, or even statewide uh, operations. We also mentioned that, as many of you know, there is still vaccine hesitancy in our country. And so uh, a few weeks ago, we put on a symposium where we invited uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, as well as, as, well as uh, several uh, local uh, clergy to be a part of the panel along with, uh, with a few of us. And really it was able to make direct contact with over 2000 individuals who signed on and discuss the whole uh, vaccine development it's, it's, uh, it's safety, it's efficacy, certain uh, uh, side effects that someone may have, which may be mild, but uh, certain myths we, we, we discussed as well. 
it was an extraordinarily uh, successful opportunity we had to share with each other. And we've gotten very positive feedback uh, from that, from that uh, webinar that we conducted. A third point I wanna mention, and just to keep you updated about your School of Medicine, your school continues to do well. I'm very proud of our colleagues uh, who have been working tirelessly to ensure that our school remains at the cutting edge. Uh, I just want to uh, point out that our School of Medicine is now at its, its highest performing uh, pinnacle. We're now in the top 10 of all public medical schools nationwide with our ranking. That is spectacular. And so we are we're no longer just a part of the fabric. We're now leading uh, in, a leading institution in the nation. Let me give an example of something that I believe you'd be happy to hear. We serve as if you, the engine of healthcare in our region. In, and there are a number of programs that we consider to be destination programs where patients will travel long distances from across the state, across the region, in some cases across the nation, or even from outside the United States to come to our programs for, we have a large multi-organ transplant program, uh, one of the largest in, in America. Uh, we also have a, a very robust uh, National Cancer Institute designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, that also is one of our destination programs for which patients will travel to receive care here not to mention a very, very uh, robust cardiac uh, surgery, cardiac medicine program, and of course, many others, not to mention neuroscience, because this has become the bedrock of, uh, of the work that we do. Like I said, these are, we, call, we describe as magnet program, programs or destination programs. <clears throat> Another area that I'd like to just to acquaint you with is many of you attended the school some since the 90s, 90s or before. But since the 1990s, we've we have had that traditional uh, program. The curriculum was in place since the 1990s. In the last uh, a couple of years, we have done an entire overhaul of our curriculum. And the new curriculum, we have uh, affectionately labeled the Renaissance curriculum and the one that preceded it, the legacy curriculum. So he, there are three points I want to share with you with regard to the Renaissance curriculum. One, it, 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 we've shortened the preclinical years to about a year and a half as opposed to two years. So students are able to get into the uh, clinics much faster and much earlier. The second is that we have uh, created a more system-based curriculum as opposed to having the first year being sort of for normal and the second year being more focused on disease we're doing normal and disease together in a very system-based approach. And the third point, which I think is really exciting, and as you may remember for medical school, we learned the basic sciences in the first year. And by the time we're in the clinical years or even as an intern, we forget the basic science. And it, one wonders whether it's applicable or relevant because we have forgotten it. Well, this is what we've done, which I think will be happy to hear. We have brought back basic sciences in the fourth year. We're calling it back to basics. So we can tie things up. The basic science starts out, we have the clinical years, and then we end with, with related basic sciences back to basics. Finally, I, I want to thank our alumni for the support that, that you have given to us over the years with your with philanthropic contributions. That has been enormously helpful to us. We have been able to uh, provide scholarships to students, needy students, merit scholarships, diversity scholarships. But overall, that has been a tremendous impact on our students. We've had uh, other forms of, uh, of, of contributions to research or to uh, professorships, and we are extraordinarily grateful to you Again, we've had a very robust alumni group and we cannot be more thankful to you. This makes the difference for us. I, I just wanna just make a one last plug because I think sometimes uh, some may, may think that because we're a state institution, 
much of her budget comes come from the state. Well, that could not be further from the truth. About 4% of her budget comes from the state, four. So the rest has to be raised in various ways, clinical care, research, philanthropy, et cetera. Your contribution cannot be overstated and how valuable it is and how much we appreciate the support you've given and how we use it wisely to advance your school. So once again, thank you for coming together. We hope we are confident that you will enjoy the, uh, the presentation of our speaker. And we want to let you know that we're here for you. Feel free to engage us in any way you wish, and we'll be happy to respond in a very rapid basis. Thank you again. Thank you, Dean Race. The School of Medicine is proud to have strong support of and partnership with our Medical Alumni Association. I'd now like to invite our Alumni Association's Executive Director, Mr. Larry Pitroff, to bring greetings on behalf of the MAA. Larry? Thank you, Mary. I just want to extend our uh, warm welcome to all the uh, participants today. I'm just scrolling down the list of attendees, and it's just wonderful to see some of your faces, but all of your names. We, uh, we're delighted to be able to, uh, to partner with the medical school to, uh, to present these offerings for you. We hope you find them informative and helpful. Um, just want to echo what Dr. Reese is saying, and I know most of you know this in reading our magazine, but the transformation that's gone on at your medical school over the past two or three decades has been truly striking. And, you know, I just take a look at, uh, we had match day, we were talking before the program and how well our, our students uh, matched last Friday. And I have, I'm lucky enough to have four of them on my advisory council and uh, four seniors. I, I just, this is anecdotal, but uh, two of them placed in urology, one at the University of North Carolina, one at the University of Chicago. One placed in pediatrics at the University of Maryland. I think she's the most fortunate of the, of the group. And then we had a, uh, uh, a student uh, match in internal medicine at Mass General. So these are the types of things. This is the type of product. And I want to call students products, but these are your legacies that are coming out of our medical school right now. And I think you really ought to be proud of what you're, uh, what you're reading about and what you're hearing about. It's all true. And we're all just uh, very, very proud of the University of Maryland. Uh, just want to let everyone know that reunion is coming up next uh, next month. We've got a bunch of programs. They're all virtual. We, we wish they could be in person, but they can't. Uh, but we do have a School of Medicine update where the dean's going to get into a little more detail. We've got a curriculum update. We have our historical CPC. There's a medical school gala. So there's a lot of programs. Uh, you'll be getting an email if you're not celebrating a milestone uh, reunion any, uh, this year. You'll be getting an email from us uh, with a link to the um, brochure and we encourage you to uh, register. So with that, I'll just uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here today and let's get on with the show. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate it as always. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter this afternoon, Dr. Kirsten Like. Dr. Like is a professor of medicine and director of the Malaria Vaccine and Challenge Unit at the School of Medicine Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. As an infectious disease physician and vaccine expert, Dr. Like has been carrying the enormous task of not only treating people hospitalized for COVID, but simultaneously working on the development of vaccines. She was the co-principal investigator for the first phase of the, of the Pfizer COVID vaccine trial. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to now welcome Dr. Kirsten Like. Thank you, Mary. Let me just share my screen. Okay. And Okay. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, I really appreciate your, your, uh, your attendance. And I'm gonna try to give you an overarching view. We have 15 minutes. So uh, uh, I'm only gonna touch on the points that I think are sort of relevant right now in my view, but you may have other questions. So this is um, meant to be open for you to ask questions when we get to the end. And hopefully I'll cover a lot of the pertinent topics. Um, as Mary mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm in the um, malaria group, <laughs> although all we've been doing the last year is COVID. And it's really through um, 
my my earlier work where I was fortunate to participate in the very first Ebola vaccine trial and then the Zika vaccine trial, where I've kind of developed a niche as a um, epidemic vaccine uh, developer. And so that was kind of the setting in which I fell into COVID earlier this year. Okay, so where do we stand uh, today? This is actually yesterday. Um, things are looking up. Uh, there's been a significant decline, as you know, in the prevalence of COVID-19 here in the United States. Up at the right, upper right-hand corner is where we were in December. I will say that there's been an uptick in Maryland um, and there has been spotty upticks um, in many other areas of the United States, uh, Michigan being one. Um, in that we're worried that as uh, governments start to roll back mask mandates and we start to relax moving into the spring and summer months that we might see a recurrence. Where we're at now is roughly 542,000 deaths and Maryland has now crossed the 8,000 death mark, um, which is just tragic to think about. What we know is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus has a 96% relatedness to um, a particular bat virus, but the other 4% is a little bit unclear. And this is a spike protein where I'm showing all the different human to animal and animal to human possibilities that have been documented thus far. And here I'm showing the furin cleavage site with the minks. You might be aware that Denmark ended up exterminating about 9 million minks because of some mutations at this portion. The um, virus is actually fairly simple in terms of the structural proteins and nearly all of the 181 vaccine approaches are really aiming at the spike protein. There's a few that are developing M protein, but overwhelmingly the spike protein is where folks are concentrated. And we know um, quite a bit about the spike protein thus far. Um, the full crystallography was sequenced um, in as early as February. And we know that, of course, this is a trimer that binds um, at the receptor binding domain to the ACE2 inhibitor. So this green portion up here is the receptor binding domain. And without getting too into the sequence structure, what I would say is that from SARS-CoV-1 years ago to SARS-CoV-2, there have been mutations in the receptor binding domain that enable the virus to bind 10 to 20 times more tightly. And that's been significant, of course, in terms of its ability to, to spread throughout the world. I wanted to touch a little bit on mutations um, because it's been so relevant recently. Uh, up till now, there's been a sweep um, of the D614. So essentially all of the United States, greater than 95% of the circulating strains were this particular mutation, the D614G. And we thought that maybe that was potentially more infectious, but we're not too worried about it. Recently though, there's been more mutations. Now I would say that the virus and all viruses live to mutate. So that's quite common. Coronavirus actually has a polymerase that self edits. And so in terms of viruses, the coronavirus has a very low mutational rate, which is why early on people were not concerned about mutations being the number one problem as opposed to influenza. However, more recently we've found that there are mutations of concern that are arising. And the two that I would point out are the UK variant, which is a uh, B117 um, that has eight mutations, but the one that's most concerning is this 501Y up here. This is the receptor binding domain and the blue portion is where the 501Y is um, uh, mapped to. The other mutation that we're quite concerned about is called the E484K. This is the South African variant, but independently has also arisen in Brazil and is known as the P1 variant. And that similarly is up here in the receptor binding domain. More recently is the New York variant, which we call B1526. And again, 
This one is now a United States circulating strain and has the E484 mutation in addition to five or six additional mutations throughout the, um, the virus. And so that leads us to a point which we call convergent evolution. And that is when mutations are arising independently at multiple different areas of the world. And so we've seen this convergent evolution with this E484K mutation, which affects the receptor binding domain and we think makes things a bit more infectious and the jury's still out in terms of whether there's more severe disease. Another point that I would make is that the earliest sample that derived from the B1526 mutational strain came from a, uh, an advanced AIDS patient in New York. So this touches on the theme that we think that immunosuppressed people might be reservoirs for mutational change. And this is one of many, many examples where within a single individual, researchers have been mapping out uh, sequential acceleration of mutations. And these may be one of the reservoirs from which mutations are arising. Now I want to touch on uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And as Mary had pointed out, I was the co-PI of the Pfizer vaccine, but also an investigator on the phase three Moderna and the Novavax, all of which are being done here at Maryland. And what I would state is that we learned from the Ebola and the Zika trials how to cut out regulatory and administrative um, uh, prolonged timelines and pair this back to what was absolutely necessary while retaining safety. And that's an important point. So for instance, with phase one trials, we usually start out very slowly. We'll work through one particular vaccine, and then that may take two years to get to the end of that trial in maybe 40 people, and then we'll switch it up. Maybe we'll test a different construct at different doses or maybe a different age group and start all over. So you can easily eat up 15 to 20 years whereas we didn't have that kind of time. What we did with this particular set of trials is we started with four different vaccines all at once in two different age groups, both the young age group and then moved to older individuals aged 65 and older and simultaneously had the ability to drop groups as we went along. And so from beginning to end, it lasted about 10 months. We have about four different vaccine approaches. If you lump them into categories. And the granddaddy, of course, is the inactivated or even live attenuated vaccines, polio, for instance. Um, the next group would be the viral protein sub subunit. We also have recombinant viral platforms where we use uh, an adenovirus, for instance, and then we splice in genes of interest. And then the last was the, uh, is the nucleic acid constructs. And you'll notice that while um, the most experiences with live or um, inactivated vaccines, what came onto the market first was the nucleic acids followed by recombinant viral proteins because these are much easier to ramp up. And it's not to say that we don't have a wealth of experience. We've been working on these for 15 to 20 years. They just hadn't gotten to licensure under the traditional licensure methodology. And I would also point out that there was no SARS 1.0 or MERS vaccine that got beyond phase one because the epidemics fizzled out and the funding dried up. So we did not have um, a ready-made uh, vaccine on the shelf to leap into. Where we're at now is that we have 181 vaccines and some might argue that that's too many. Why are we putting all our resources into so many? Be that as it may, we have a wealth of vaccines that are coming onto the market and I think that we'll see the vaccine supply increased um, significantly. The first approach that I'm going to touch on is the nucleic acid mRNA. And as you know, this is very unstable. And it took a decade to really figure out how to stabilize this. This has been an approach that's really been focused upon in uh, the cancer world. Because you can imagine, you can program um, uh, the cell to make any protein in the world that you want. And that's essentially what we're doing with mRNA. You can think of it just like a little bit of computer code that's telling our cell to make a protein. It never incorporates into DNA. It's very unstable and dissolves within hours. And it took technology to figure out how best to stabilize this. So when people are concerned that 
this may have long-term sequelae. I would say that there's no way that this incorporates into the DNA and that the RNA is so unstable, it dissolves very quickly. And so what we're left with is protein that's been manufactured and our body then is able to mount antibody response against these proteins. Um, the real uh, um, breakthrough in terms of delivery are the nanolipids. And this is the proprietary portion where Pfizer has their own proprietary nanolipids, Moderna has their own. The vaccines are essentially the same, but they have different nanolipids. And one of the nanolipids is a pegylated nanolipid. And that is where we have focused upon some of the severe anaphylaxis that has occurred in about uh, I think it's 11 out of every million people, so quite low, but early on was obviously the um, focus of a lot of, uh, of the news stories in terms of people having adverse reaction to these mRNA vaccines. UMBCVD was the very first to vaccinate as part of this trial. Um, this is one of our volunteers, volunteer 001, the very first person to receive any mRNA COVID vaccine uh, here in the United States. What we learned very quickly is that um, among the many different types of vaccines we were testing at the time, that they all produce very good immunity and that more importantly had excellent immune response. And I'm showing the neutralizing antibody response in older individuals between the vaccine constructs. Ultimately, we went with this B2 construct, mainly because it had a little less side effect profile than the B1. I would also point out that older individuals tend to have less side effects than the younger individuals. And so it was awarded um, EUA on December 12th after the VRPAC meeting. Um, and essentially, as you know, the vaccine efficacy was proven to be 95% in uh, over the entire trial and 94% in people older than 65. Now this was only two month data and we're still collecting data as we go along, but real world information is trickling in, particularly the uh, data from Israel that's validating that the vaccine efficacy really is in the high 90s, really unprecedented um, as compared to any other vaccine that we've had experience with in the past. What does this mean? Here I'm showing the Kaplan-Meier curve and the blue is our placebo group, the red is the vaccine. And right around day 10, so not even after the second vaccine, you can start to see divergence of the groups in terms of vaccine efficacy. So you are seeing response after one dose, but the point is you need that second dose to develop neutralizing antibody, which is the very important antibody response that we need to control COVID. Fortunately, the Moderna results one week later were near identical, 94.1%, and importantly validated that we're seeing almost zero severe disease in those volunteers who were vaccinated. Both the Pfizer and Moderna trial really did strive to diversify in terms of the ethnic makeup. Um, it may not be as high as some wished. Here in Baltimore, we had about 40% African-American, but trial-wide in 120 trial sites, it was about 10%. Also significant Asian, Latinx, Native American representation, which was critical for people to trust the vaccines. I wanna point out this um, article from the New England Journal from just about 12, uh, maybe two to three weeks ago. And what I'm, how I, how, what I'm outlining here is mRNA response to the South African strain. And what I would point out is that very robust response against all these other strains it is reduced against the South African strain, but still robust response. Efficacy seen with the Pfizer, and I would extrapolate that also to the Moderna since they're almost identical. Briefly touching on the Janssen vaccine manufactured in partnership with Johnson & Johnson. This uses an adenovirus vector, AD26, that splices in the spike protein. It's one injection by design. There's also a two injection study going on and that may prove to be better. In fact, it probably would, but the benefit to one injection that has a stable cold chain, um, the company deemed that to be more important in terms of rolling this out. It has about 72% efficacy in the US. It's reduced efficacy in South Africa where the preponderance of strains were the South African strain, but importantly, very, very high protection against severe disease. The Russian Sputnik is a similar vaccine, 
Although it's a heterologous, heterologous vaccine, they use the ad 26 as a prime an ad five vector as a boost, and they had a purported 92% vaccine efficacy. I wanna to touch on the um, AstraZeneca. Now, as opposed to the adenovirus, this plan uses chimpanzee adenovirus, which has been um, inactivated and unable to cause disease in humans. And similarly to the Janssen product, they've spliced in the spike protein. And as you know, there's been some hiccups along the way. The very first uh, hiccup was the fact that there was a mistake made in terms of the delivery. So we're not quite clear if the company plans on giving the full two dose, full strength vaccine or a two dose where they get a half strength in dose one. You've probably heard that the US trial vaccine efficacy was 79%. And yet there is some grumbling amongst some of the data safety monitoring board that all the data wasn't presented. I don't have access. We did not conduct this trial. So I don't know any more than you do. I do know that there's been an association of concern with blood clots. There have been 37 cases of pulmonary embolism or DVTs in the 17 and a half million people that are vaccinated. And it turns out that that prevalence is below that which we would expect in a population of nearly 18 million people anyway. So when you hear about these very, very uncommon side effects, the first thing you should ask yourself is, well, what is the baseline rate of the population in terms of pulmonary embolism and DVTs? And apparently the European Medicine Agency feels that that uh, correlation did not hold up because the prevalence in society was higher than the 37 events that they saw. Lastly, I want to end with uh, Novavax, which you'll be hearing about shortly. This is a protein subunit. Anytime you have a protein vaccine, you need something to help it with its immune response. And in this case, it's an adjuvant. And so the Novavax vaccine requires an adjuvant. It's a proprietary matrix M adjuvant. But the Novavax from the very beginning, many of us have been excited about. I don't know if you can see, it's a little bit low. Here is the neutralizing antibody responses. They're around three and a half to 4,000. That compares, that's roughly 10 times the amount that the mRNA produces. Now we don't know what the lower threshold is. We don't know, in other words, how many do you need to protect you against getting COVID? We do know that the Novavax vaccine produces the highest immune responses of any vaccine tested to date. And reportedly phase two vaccine efficacy is 92%. The have closed enrollment in the phase three and we're in the surveillance period waiting to reach the milestone, which I think you'll be hearing within the month about reaching the level we need to ascertain how effective it is in the phase three trial. And then this will come up before the FDA as well. So I wanna end and just say that some of our goals and hurdles, obviously the infrastructure was um, rocky at the beginning and with increased vaccine availability and increased infrastructure, the rollout has improved significantly. Vaccine trials in pregnant women are imminent Vaccine trials in children six months to 12 years old have started under the IDCRC and the University of Maryland is an IDCRC partner. There's 10 of us in the United States. We're assessing the utility of the vaccine in asymptomatic viral carriage. It does look like the vaccines reduce asymptomatic carriage. Urgent need for coordinated campaign to address, to address vaccine hesitancy. That hasn't been such an issue while we're in the middle of vaccine scarcity and more people want the vaccine than are denying it. But we hope that those people that are on the fence start to jump over as they see the millions of people who are getting vaccinated safely. And lastly, I would say that we're now in plans for assessing variant lineage and booster doses so that if we need to give boosters or if we need to change the vaccine to match the variants, that we are prepared come autumn to do so if that's needed. With that, I would end here and open it up for questions. 
um, and just say that I'm funded under a variety of grants with the many, many people, but I would have to thank everyone at the Center for Vaccine Development. We've been fighting for over a year now, giving up Christmas vacation, giving up summer vacations. We've been working 24 seven to get these vaccines rolled out and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Like, we appreciate it. Great presentation. Um, early on, we had our first question, which was interesting. It's not a vaccine question, but they wonder why water fountains were shut down and when they'll be allowed to be back on. <laughs> well, early on, we were treating this like influenza. And influenza, we know that fomites um, carry the virus. That's probably not as big of a concern. And so I have no idea when they'll turn the fountains back on, but I think the fear was that they were reducing any reservoirs whatsoever, um, particularly waterborne, foodborne, et cetera. Um, uh, so hopefully those will come back on soon, especially with spring and summer around the corner. Then the question also, you had mentioned about the phase three trial will be closing soon within a, or finishing, you'd have data soon within a month. And yeah. when do you think that it might be approved and being released? Yeah, then? so this is just a guesstimate because um, obviously the Pfizer, Moderna, and even Janssen, I would say quote unquote benefited, which is not so much a benefit, but because the COVID rate and the prevalence in the United States was so high, they were able to reach their target milestones earlier than anticipated. In fact, Pfizer had a milestone of 90, I think it was 90 cases of COVID. And by the time that they realized they were close, they had overshot that to 170 just because there was so much COVID going on. So to some extent, it depends on what the circulation uh, is in terms of the country. Um, with COVID. That's why we have so many sites and international sites. But when I said it's closed to enrollment, I meant that all the volunteers have been given their two doses of vaccine and they've closed any new volunteers from enrolling. And we're in that surveillance period where we're waiting to see once we accumulate enough COVID vac um, uh, episodes, they'll break the code and see how many were in the placebo arm, how many were in the actual vaccine arm, and we'll be able to have um, some estimate of what the vaccine efficacy is. Once that's um, known, the company has to put together a gigantic submission uh, for consideration for EUA with the FDA. Simultaneously, they're also doing this for Europe and the other countries. So, this is a really big ask of the companies. They have a lot to do. Um, so I would estimate that we'll have COVID prevalence um, by mid-April, I would guess. And I would estimate it goes before the FDA in May. That, that's going to be my guess. All right. Um, and you were talked about the variants and um, the, you know, the different spread is are we should we be concerned that it would continue a lot of variants will continue to happen or now that the vaccines are starting to happen will do you think we will see less variants so here's what what here's here's how that works so um mutations occur over time and as you start to squeeze the virus in terms of the pockets it can reach it starts to mutate with that pressure so that's why so many of us are saying the faster we vaccinate, the more we eradicate those pools. Now we don't operate in a bubble. We're the United States, people travel. So not only do we have to be worried about the United States, but we have to worry about the world. Our first job is to vaccinate everyone in the United States. And that is an overwhelming chore in and of itself particularly because there are a group of people that don't want, do, do not want to be vaccinated and we have to reach 70, 80% for herd immunity. So the quicker we vaccinate it, the less mutations occur, the better chance we have to get on top of this. However, if we delay and things take longer and people don't get vaccinated, it enables pockets of people to get mutation, which then becomes a problem. Am I worried about the mutations? Yes, because it does reduce vaccine efficacy. Have we reached a point where the vaccines are no longer effective? No, they're all effective against the mutations that we know about now. 
So we don't know what's in the future. And again, time is important. And that's why we keep telling people, wear your masks, practice social distancing. We are starting to open up. You can have small groups of people who have been vaccinated, but carefully because we don't want this to break out again in terms of prevalence, getting in, rooting into different pockets and taking off again with a third wave. Um, you talked about the boosters and being ready for that. Yeah. I guess, is there any data to show whether or not you think you'll need those or is that something to be seen for the future still? It's something to be seen for the future. We're, we're trying to take, uh, we're trying to keep two steps ahead of the virus. So we're, uh, we've already vaccinated our Pfizer volunteers with a booster. They've already gotten those. The very first volunteers were vaccinated last May. So these people are 10 months out in terms of their vaccines. So they're an ideal population to test booster vaccines and also booster variant vaccines or other variant lineage spike proteins. So we're already testing that. Moderna's already testing that as well. And we're in the process of designing large trials that are gonna be able to answer that across the Janssen, Novavax, mRNA platforms to get questions answered by summer so that we know what to do come autumn. Great. Um, and then my last question I have was about, you know, you talked about the blood clots with AstraZeneca. Yeah. There, has there been really any other concerns with the other um, Moderna, Pfizer, and other vaccines that have been released? Yeah. So what we're talking about is ultra rare events. So number one, there is a small population of people that have severe anaphylaxis, usually people that have profound allergies anyways. That's shaken out to be somewhere between, if I recall, 11 per million. So low, it never would have been picked up in phase three trials because we only uh, enroll 40,000 or so. So we're talking about ultra rare events. Now the Pfizer also noted eight um, Bell's palsies and Moderna did as well. It turns out that that eight per uh, 40, 70, I think there were eight in both trials. So let's say 75,000. That's below the rate of Bell's palsies that you would see in a random population of 100,000 people. So while we're watching it carefully, there's no reason to think that mRNA would trigger Bell's palsy. It's something that we did notice and we're watching. Very much. We appreciate your time um, and all your great information today. It was very helpful, and I'm sure our audience um, appreciated it. Thank you, Dr. Reese, also. And um, this concludes our discussion. I want to thank all of you for tuning in, and we look forward to having you at a future Doctor in Dialogue event. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.